Welcome to Skyline Community Church here in my living room and in Ken and Jane's and Tom and Katie's and Gabrielle's and yours. Welcome home to the diaspora. Eight weeks of shelter in place, but who's counting? You know, that saying, we make plans and God laughs. Before COVID-19, we plan to share a book study focusing on the theme of the great spiritual migration. And here we are literally experiencing the great spiritual migration as we become church without walls, without a building, creating new ways to be community, making space apart, but together. And not just in Oakland, but all over the country as our sanctuary, our home, as the place and time in which we gather for the common good. And so today, may our souls be refreshed by God, our divine mother and father, who knows and loves us better than we know and love ourselves. So I invite you to welcome every bit of yourself and all of us, whether you're young or old or sick or well or queer or straight or afraid or at peace, whether you're orphaned or adopted, lonely or overrun with too many people in your space. Welcome to people of all colors and genders and body shapes and sizes, all physical and mental and emotional abilities and moments. Welcome to all those who, despite their solitude, are connected with the whole world in the sense that we are all going through this together. All of us in our great diversity, in our gathering today, as this one body of Christ, this one community, and through our gathering, we are made a little more whole and a little more perfect in our sharing. And so we're reminded that this body has bodies. So I invite you to stretch, roll your neck, inhabit your body. You can take these beautiful hands and put your hands on your heart. So nice to see you stretching. I learned that from my kitty cat, stretch. And if you're blessed to have someone with you, you can reach out and hug them. Otherwise hug this beautiful gift of a body, this sanctuary home. Give thanks to God for the earth and for yourself and one another. Breathe in deeply, fill up your breath, extend to one another a sign of peace and rise as you're able for our opening hymn. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home a long way from home a new verse for today sometimes I feel like a desert with no rain. Sometimes I feel like a desert with no rain. Sometimes I feel like a desert with no rain. Sometimes I feel like a desert with no rain a long way from home a long way from home speak 
Spirit, like a mother, come hold us now. Spirit, like a rainfall, surround us now. Spirit, like a blanket, come cover us now. And give us comfort like home and give us comfort like Amen. So, for our opening prayer today, in lieu of children's time, I'd like to speak to the inner child within each one of us, this sense of all of us being a motherless child, who in this case happened to be a kitty. It was a, a late and rainy night in October, almost two years ago. And my landlord, Jamie, showed up on my doorsteps with this mischievous smile on her face. I did something crazy, she said. And I looked in her arms and I saw a tiny marmalade kitten with huge eyes looking at me with mean looking lacerations on his nose. I rescued him, she said. He was abandoned, and now my cats are trying to attack him. Can you take care of him for a few days? At first, I felt inconvenienced. What? A cat? Kitty litter? Cat food? Yuck! But something in the wind beckoned me. I'd been meditating on the parable of the Good Samaritan, and Jesus' words, whatever you do to the least of these, you do unto me. I gazed at him and he looked up at me like an, a little orange baby Moses in the bulrushes. And I said, yes. And a few days has now become almost two years. And so here he is, my adopted son, who has brought great joy into my life, Oliver Cato Manning. And so here he is. So beloved, let us pray. There is an orphan child or kitty within each one of us, searching to love and to be loved. Inspire us to love, okay, bye. <laughs> Beyond this hour, despite our reluctance, and in so doing, we become the embodiment of your justice, your love, your hope, and your peace. Amen. And now let us open our hearts to hear this beautiful music for preparation. How deep the silence of the soul. How deep the silence of the soul that lives within your dreams. Oh, the gratitude of hearts in your abiding place. What rich serenity is found. What courage and relief when wisdom teaches us to seek the gentle path to peace like unseen charms on moving air like warm and morning Things 
like trees with blooms begun. Such is your presence in our life. You touch with outer trees until we find and turn ourselves out fast in your embrace until we turn and find ourselves out fast Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Before our gospel reading for this morning, I'd like to give you a context. The reading for this morning comes from John's gospel, written about 125 AD, a long time after Jesus had walked this earth. John is speaking to a small, highly persecuted community separated from their Jewish roots and persecuted by Rome, feeling isolated, orphaned, and abandoned. Experiencing, as many of us are in these days, the dark night of the soul. In John's Gospel, Jesus speaks in four long chapters, preparing his disciples for life after his execution for the time when they will feel utterly broken and lost and abandoned and showing them the way to stay united with God. This morning's reading from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21 from the Inclusive Bible Translation, Anna Sachman. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another companion, another helper to be with you always. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot accept since the world neither sees nor recognizes. But you can recognize the spirit because the spirit remains with you and will be within you. I won't leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. A little while now and the world will see no more, but you'll see me because I live and you will live as well. On that day, you'll know that I am in God and you are in me and I am in you. Those who obey my commandments are the ones who love me and those who love me will be loved by Abba God. I too, will love them and will reveal myself to them. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts, kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that we may be renewed and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. <sighs> this experience of being orphaned, abandoned, brings back memories of one of my most painful and vivid childhood experiences that happened when I was about six years old. In New York City, we were on a family trip to see the World's Fair. Now, New York City was a trip in itself, seeing Manhattan for the first time. It was like walking through the bottom of the Grand Canyon, gazing at those sheer canyon walls of skyscrapers and looking up at the sky, the heavens above. But the World's Fair was truly out of this world. And while we were walking around the fairgrounds, I became fascinated with this enormous globe of planet Earth and I assumed we were all fascinated by it. But when I looked around, all I could see was the crowd. I couldn't see the familiar faces of my family, my mother, my father, my sister Karen, my brother Steve. 
I'll never forget the ache and panic, that sinking feeling in my heart, that raw terror in my gut. I was alone in this enormous crowd in New York City, anonymous, and I felt like I was going to die. But fortunately, a volunteer at a nearby information booth spotted me in tears. My family's gone, I cried. And she comforted me, sweetie, tell me your name. She said, we'll go to the intercom, we'll make an announcement. I am not going to leave you alone. I'm here to help. I heard her voice over the intercom. Lori Manning is looking for her family. And for what seemed to me to be an eternity, although it was probably 60 seconds, I scanned the crowd, this sea of unfamiliar faces. And then I spotted first my dad's face and then my mom. And then Stephen and Karen running toward us. And I'll never forget the expressions on their face. This mixture of panic and relief. We all embraced and they explained to me how we'd gotten separated and reassured me that they would never leave without me, never abandon me, never leave me orphaned. If you've never been accidentally separated from your parents as a child, I think it was an accident, Perhaps as a parent, you've, you've had the experience of having to leave your child with someone else for the first time. The first few days of preschool are hell, listening to the mournful wailing of crying children, witnessing their unbearable pain of separation from their parents, which to a child, seems like death to the child their beloved parents are their world their sun moon and stars their life their god and it's so easy for us to return to that original unbearable pain of separation experiencing as we must as we all must life's most painful deaths, especially the deaths of those we love. But there are also many other deaths as well, including the death of deeply held beliefs and hopes. And one that's heavy on my heart these days is my belief and hope in our once great country, this grief in what seems like a slow moving train wreck of fear and lies and greed and hatred and violence in our country, our mother father country. And now in the midst of this frightening COVID-19 pandemic and the greatest economic collapse since the Great Depression, many of us are feeling orphaned and abandoned, betrayed by our imagined mother father country. Some of us are in despair that even faith in Jesus has been co-opted in the perverted worship of Wall Street. And some of us wonder, is there even a God? And if so, where is he or she? And why is all of this happening? And where is the inoculation for this? Where is the vaccine? And for some of us, myself included at times, the pain is so great that we numb ourselves to it. We stoically carry on or avoid the pain in escapism. But in doing so repeatedly over a period of months and years, I believe we ultimately end up abandoning ourselves because that pain, that longing opens us to our heart's deepest desire the desire to be held, sheltered, loved by a parent who will never abandon us. As the great third century theologian Augustine put it, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O God.
but where exactly are you, God? Far away off in the future or long ago in the past? Far away in some distant place or other religion? Some of us will search everywhere for that God, traveling far away on pilgrimages to holy places like the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem or 10,000 feet high into the, the clouds in Machu Picchu in Peru or Tiger's Nest in Bhutan or Kathmandu in the foothills of the Himalayas in Nepal to explore shrines and temples in search of our hearts, one true place of rest, this home, this sanctuary. But the truth is for many of us, this summer, that pilgrimage is likely to be in our backyard or a local park. So what am I really getting at today? Well, I believe if you really want to find God, take a trip to a holy place. I encourage you to take this story this afternoon and go somewhere quiet sit alone, preferably outside, and feel the breeze, and slowly take in this passage from John and enter into the story, listening with the child within you. Earlier in this passage, Jesus prepares his disciples as if they are his beloved children for times just like now when we feel orphaned by God. This text is a part of Jesus' farewell speech to his followers. And he says, trust in God, trust in me. And he talks about this absolutely transcendent, unknowable God as Abba, as daddy. And he says, in my father's house, there are many rooms and I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus was leaving. And he knew that they were going to feel very abandoned, homeless, orphaned. And so like a loving parent, he prepares his children for this time. What would they do when he was gone? What would life be like when there was no longer any holy land, no longer any temple, no longer any home with God? And one of the things that was even harder for John's gospel readers was that they were not living in a time and place to experience Jesus firsthand. And they felt that absence sharply. What about us, they wondered. Do we just have secondhand faith? Do we have to keep our faith alive just by reading about it in a book? Do we have to live all of our lives on this thin diet of fond memories of what used to be and spending our time wishing that we had lived there hundreds of years ago and now us thousands of years ago instead of here and now? The first hearers of John's gospel were worried about that. And so Jesus in John's account gave them this word, wherever you are, will be that holy land, will be that temple, will be your home in God. Jesus goes on to say, I will ask the Father, and the Father, Abba, will send you another advocate, another helper, an intercessor. God will send another comforter. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the Numa, wisdom, the spirit of truth and wisdom, and she will never leave you. The Holy Spirit of wisdom, she will be to you as I have been to my disciples, Jesus promised. There will be no loss of power or presence. Wherever you are, the Holy Spirit will be with you always. And then Jesus said something that many people forget. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, abide, dwell in me, and my Father and I will come and dwell in you. He said, I'm going to prepare a dwelling place for you. And we usually think of that as a future promise. 
and it is. But he also says, my father and I will come and take up rooms with you, dwelling places within you. The Holy Spirit, Christ, and God will come and live among us and with us and in us in our home? Wow, that's a lot of guests. I better clean up. I better make space. So wherever we are, here, there, anywhere, that becomes the Holy Land. That becomes the sacred ground, the sanctuary, the home with God. And we're invited to claim it for ourselves. How do we begin? We begin by slowing down, taking in the simple nourishment of this story and emptying the clutter in our minds and our lives. We're invited to enlarge this inner world, this inner home of our lives. Because how can the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit dwell in us if there's no room? We need to clean out a bunch of stuff and make room within our crowded houses. But you might be saying it's week eight of shelter in place and social distancing. I feel so claustrophobic at home. But it's also an opportunity to discover this full and good life within our interior home including welcoming the depths of those painful longings within us, welcoming them with compassion and love, welcoming them, welcoming the spirit of wisdom to help us to be mindfully present to these thoughts and fears and worries, to be accompanied by her, to bring them to our prayers, to God, and to share our prayers with one another because we, you and I, are not alone. And then we must listen with a small, still voice within to the gentle counselor, the advocate, spirit wisdom, who whispers to us softly, reminding us I want you to love me too. And if you love me, make space and time for me each day to reaffirm our love. If you love me, keep your promises to me. Keep, your, keep my commandments. It's so easy and yet it's so hard to do, to serve faithfully and to speak truthfully and to pray every day to serve someone else and to make someone else's life better, fresher, more abundant. Simplify your life and leave everything else to me, she says. So we don't have to catch a plane. We don't even have to drive to this church. The sanctuary is here within us. Lord, prepare me, prepare us all to be a sanctuary, amen. Love, prepare me to be a sanctuary. in the house of my soul so I try not to go there where it's lonely and cold I blacken the windows I pretend I do not care I seal all the 
doorways I pretend it's not there Spirit like a mother come warm this room again and remove all the detritus that cover the window pane let the music fill all the air. Open the windows and doors. Let joy be found there. Love, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. the morning rain. Amen. Amen. I never know how Ken's going to respond. I can't believe it. Thank you so much. Beloved, it's time to pray. It's time to empty our crowded hearts. To let go of our anger and our fear and our worries to be left with the peace that passes understanding. And so I want to try something different together today in our prayers. Let us begin by emptying our hearts to name those fears and griefs and angers and worries for those we love who are sick, including ourselves. To allow our hearts then to be filled up to give thanks for the blessings of life and then to pray together the Lord's Prayer. So I invite you to take a posture of prayer, whether it's if you wanna raise your hands in blessing, if you wanna kneel, if you wanna hold your hands over your heart, you can, you can cut your video, you don't have to be shy now. And let us open ourselves to the same spirit of the disciples to listen to their their way, how they modeled for us how to be beloved community, to be together, whether they were afraid or courageous, to follow you. And we join them opening our hearts and pouring them out to you, typing them into the chat bar, raising our hands or just stating them out loud to hear each other's prayers. We pray for all those who are sick or at home or in the hospital. We continue to pray for Nyla Oaks. We pray for Karen Aaron Price's husband, Paul. We pray for Claude. And we continue to pray for the family of Will Lang. We pray for young families caring for children and aging parents and all the pressures in these times of uncertainty. We pray for medical caregivers. We pray for those, all those recovering from surgeries. We pray for the 33 million people in this country who are unemployed and the 88,000 people who have died in this country. And for the hundreds of millions around the world who are unemployed and the hundreds of thousands who have died and who are at risk. We pray for those who are unsheltered, living in encampments here. We pray for those who are suffering from depression or anxiety and other mental health challenges. We grieve and mourn 
with the families of all those who are mourning the death of loved ones. We pray for our elected leaders that they may be guided by the common good and the heart of the early followers. We pray for Sarah Davis, who is with her mother, who is very sick. And we pray for all those unacknowledged griefs, like David Guerra and Allegra and Claude, who lost their beloved cat this past week. Are there, and I'll look at the chat room to see if there are other prayers. I see a lot of prayers of gratitude this morning. Prayers for my neighbor, Sarah, from Becky, who's an ER nurse at Highland and has an eight-year-old son, yes. So not only the pressures of frontline healthcare workers for their own health, but their concerns about passing on the virus to others. Are there other prayers? Is anyone raising their hands? I don't see hands raised. Prayers for our friend, this is Catherine, our friend Marianne, who just lost her young son in, a, in an automobile accident. May she feel how much we care for her. Thank you, Catherine. Are there others? And so I pray, this is Tara. Oh, that's private. Okay. All right. So after a good cry, peace comes. And so we lift up this and we open up the space for gratitudes and joys for every blessing in life. And here are a few of my gratitudes for this week. I've been really enjoying the sidewalk chalk. The clearer than clear blue skies. The shimmering waters. The fragrance of jasmine. Fresh block parties. Zoom as a technology. Kindness is everywhere. Lemon harvest and chard harvest laid out for neighbors, for bird songs and stargazing, for friends and sunlight and dogs and cats and Zoom concerts. Are there other gratitudes? Gratitude, this is Susan for Jeremy's workplace that is entering a refreshing phase of, in, of improved teamwork. Sean, prayers for our beautiful fresh air and clean cities and lots of hiking. And prayers for each one of us, and prayers for this community. Prayers, Eileen, lifting up prayers for 2020 graduates. Yes, let us not forget them. An unacknowledged accomplishment or hard to celebrate just by Zoom. Gratitude for neighbors, Nancy Taylor. Gratitude for climate change slowing due to the pandemic, a wonderful silver lining. Prayers for our political leaders who have difficult decisions, budget decisions to make. And gratitude for us all. And so for all of these blessings, hear our prayers, O oh God. And united in voice, we pray to you, God who loves us like a father, like a mother, like wisdom. And please join in the prayer response that's printed in our bulletins. Our creator, mother, father, God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
And so at this time, I'd now like to welcome our co-chair of Justice and Witness to share a reflection about a life-giving ministry in which she responds to children who might feel especially orphaned in these challenging times as undocumented people, especially now with COVID-19. Let us welcome Mirtha. Thank you, Pastor Lori. Good morning. I'd like to share a recent experience I had with someone who I consider a hero for all he does for his community, his students, and his family. He is love and faith in action, and his name is Henry. He is a tireless Mayan mom community leader and organizer who volunteers his time to teach mom language class at Laney on Saturdays. He works for the Oakland Library when it's open. He's an interpreter for non-English speaking mom immigrants and does census work for the mom community. He's an extremely hard worker. And recently I found out that he was organizing some volunteers to distribute food to more than 800 families at the Nueva Esperanza Sunday Preschool, Iglesia de Dios. So I emailed him with questions about the food distribution and that perhaps Skyline Church may want to support this project since we've been accompanying the children there through the Sunday preschool. And in his email response to my questions, he said that he was sick with a fever and cough. And I called him right away and he sounded very weak. He did get tested for COVID and he was staying in bed to isolate as best as possible. However, isolation is difficult because he lives with his pregnant wife and many family members in a small home. And I was heartbroken to hear all of this and I wanted to do something to help. So later that day, I thought I'd surprise him with groceries for his family and a check for his food donation project. When I arrived at his house, I called to have someone come down and collect the items. But Henry answered and he said he wasn't at home, but on his way to the hospital with his pregnant wife because she was feeling sick. And I thought as sick as he was, he had to accompany her because she doesn't speak much English. And I was afraid and saddened just imagining what they were going through. I've met Henry's wife at Laney. She's very sweet and kind. And I recall that she had gotten up very early on a Saturday to make tamales for Henry's morning mom class at Laney. And now I could picture her being rushed to the hospital. I prayed and prayed. And a week went by and I was too afraid to call or email him. I didn't want to disturb him knowing that he would probably try to respond regardless of his condition. Then last Tuesday evening, I sent him an email asking if he and his wife were getting better and if I could do something to help. And I was so relieved and happy when he responded, yes, they were getting better. So he has had a very difficult and trying time and is quarantined with all of his family. I was happy to drop off some groceries and to share with him the good news that Nancy Taylor and her husband had picked up lots of fruit and onions from the food bank and were delivering it to the Iglesia de Dios. He has expressed much gratitude and says people like us motivate him. And I was thinking, that's the way I feel about him and Nancy and so many others and the other organizations who embody love and faith in action, helping the vulnerable and needy. So perhaps some of you will be motivated to support the food distribution project. Henry has partnered with Mandela Partners and Alameda Food Bank to receive bags of food. They could use fruits, chicken, rice, beans, eggs, and milk. So the monetary donations will be used to buy these foods and supplies to keep the volunteers protected from the virus. Now I'll be happy to answer questions and give updates on the food distribution tomorrow, Monday at 7 
p.m. during our Justice and Witness Zoom meeting, which will focus on voter suppression and support for undocumented people. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mirtha. And Mirtha and Nancy, our Justice and Witness co-chairs, please join us this Monday. So today we call upon each one of us as children of God to share in the love and the work of Jesus, caring particularly for the most vulnerable children living here in our city. And so in addition to today's offering, you are invited to give to the programs listed at the end of your bulletins. We will now hear this morning's offering. Amen. May these gifts, O oh God, become action and intention, fulfilling your commandment to love. Amen. And we will now hear our closing song. Very similar. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> one is night, one is night and dreams. <laughs>
So let us bless one another. Let us see your blessing hands. Lift up your hands to offer blessing. Beloved, go forth in this new day, this new season, embracing what is, that it is a time to refrain from physical embrace and also a time to reach out in new and creative ways. It is a time of remembering the courage of those first disciples, their strength, their transformation from orphans into bold, courageous leaders filled with love. In this time of waiting and hoping, you and I, we are being prepared and encouraged and blessed by the advocate whose love warms us and surrounds us like the sunlight. For God is with us. She is with us always, as close as our beating hearts. Amen. Mm -hmm.